and the planning methods that we follow also further facilitates these exclusionary patterns. And therefore, there is a need for significant transformation in the way we plan and the way we actually have policies. And what I want to touch upon are these three strategies which I feel one can work on if we actually can realize this dream of making housing for all a reality. How can we plan with equity? How can we have policy of housing? Essentially, I am talking about rental housing, which reaches out to everybody. You will recall that when we had COVID, and in the COVID, most of the people who were driven away were in this informal sector, where maybe 35 to 40 percent of the people in the informal sectors are staying in informal rental housing. The government, as a response to that, came up with a fifth vertical in the housing for all four verticals. They added a fifth vertical for the affordable rental housing scheme. But then that does not reach out to the informal sector at all. And therefore, when we say that this is a response to COVID, so that people in such a disaster-like situation do not are not driven away from their homes, have we actually come up with a policy? which will reach out to the poorest of the poor. According to me, no, we have not done that. And third, of course, is the regulatory oversight, which began with the RERA in 2016-17, but then it is reaching out to only ownership housing. I would feel that this regulatory oversight has to reach out to every sector of housing. Talking about planning, that's the first aspect I spoke about. We have to actually bring in inclusive, inclusive inclusion and not populism. Today what we have, especially in Maharashtra, is everything will be given out, doled out free to you. A free housing in SRA, a free housing in Mahada, or a free housing in the CES buildings. So wherever you talk about a redevelopment or a brownfield redevelopment, you are talking about only what can be given free. And then you have further populism there, where there is a competitive thing of, can you not be given a 500 square feet free home free? Because in Dharavi, someone is coming up with a policy of 360 or 400, someone else comes to bring me back to power, I'll give you 500. So, are we going on the right track? Is that a sustainable way to actually deal with the problem of housing? No, according to me. So, today's redevelopment policy is where additional FSI is given, which will either go to give a free housing to the existing dwellers, or in order to give a free housing, you will create what is called as multi-luxury housing, which all goes for 60,000 rupees plus square feet. So, can we have development plans? We have a one presently going on in Mumbai called 2034. In fact, when I was in the planning committee, we actually said that today in the plan, we should not only have legends like a residential. When you actually mark out a residential in a development plan, you feel that this residential is going to cater to everybody, but it doesn't. So can you not have within residential sub legends which talk about affordable residential? Can you have affordable rental residential? Can you have affordable workspaces? Now I feel time has come when we should actually mark out these spaces while we are planning so that we can have equity in planning. So this is something which I feel is possible to be done. I don't know why we are not doing it. The second is, which is a part of the development plan also, which we call the development control regulations, which all of you would be dealing with, which is the way buildings are constructed, is something which I feel does not take into account as to how the poor make their own homes. The poor make their own homes in an incremental manner. The poor make their homes where they do not conform to what is mentioned in the development control regulation as you should have a minimum home size of 90 square feet for habitable homes. Why? Why should we actually get stuck to that? Can you not young professionals come up with some sort of a development control regulation which is more inclusive in nature? I feel time has come when we should talk about that. Then most of these homes which gradually go into an incremental sort of uh, nature will all come under the formal setup. Second, as I mentioned, is that there is over emphasis on ownership housing. The Housing for All program, PMAY, also talks about ownership housing. I think the time has come 
that this utter neglect towards rented housing should be actually shunned and we should try and see how they can bring in more rental housing which will be more affordable in nature and it is not merely creation of the affordable rental housing which you can do by having such uh, things in the development plan but also you can have inclusive sort of policies where any any development housing development must have a minimum percentage of uh, affordable stock which can then thereafter be uh, properly managed with the concept of as i have mentioned a proper o and m of the uh, arh the affordable rental housing complexes which will do proper management fair allocation rent setting eviction if necessary now these things have to be done not by a public sector because government has not been known to be very good managers of such complexes you will have to bring in uh, efficient stakeholders to come in to actually see how we can do this and coming to the third aspect this is of course what was brought in in 2016-17 called the real estate regulation act rera and rera as i keep on saying has these three keys which is trying to aim at transparency because transparency takes care of majority of problems your uh, information asymmetry has to, gets gets removed because you give out all information in the public domain especially when you are buying a home you should know what am i buying am i getting value for money or not trust building is another important thing which is at the lowest ebb because today any home buyer feels that he cannot trust the developer because the developer may not deliver in time may not give him the quality work and timely project completion is another problem that has been there in the past so this rera tries to achieve these three t's trying to bring transparency in the whole dealing process trying to create trust remove the trust deficit between buyer and seller and assuring you of a timely completion of a project but then this is something which has had a good beginning talking about construction of ownership housing i feel that this should get extended even to uh, further so these are the three things that i wanted to share with you at this juncture where i feel that if we have proper planning processes which are inclusive in nature if we have proper housing which reaches out to the poorest of the poorest the marginalized community and if we have proper regulatory oversight which through some efficient body oversees these construction because we are bringing in a private sector private sector without a proper regulation will not be able to deliver the best and here i think i'll stop maybe in the course of the further deliberations we can have the questions thank you so much
monetary accessible but also accessibility in terms of your social networks, your power networks, your uh, access to information, uh, to be even aware of the fact that you know you have a housing of a particular kind in Singapore. Okay? And that's why I thought that it, it's a very interesting point when all of us can reflect on the housing history in India. Okay? And I want to go a little back uh, to remind everyone, uh, you know, that how did we start with the conversation about housing uh, and reflect a little bit on the history of the improvement trust and the housing board and how we have reached the point we are here now. Okay? Uh, I draw a lot of my conversations from my own work of reading and writing which I have been doing from Bihar. Uh, so I, I have done a lot of research work in Patna and other northern Indian states and smaller cities. Um, because I have always believed that you know, Bombay has a very limited world for a lot of conversation and on not all conversation should just only be about uh, redevelopment or SRA or Dharavi model. Um, although, you know, if you go to any other municipality in, this, in the country, they will always say, Madam, wo Dharavi jaisa banana hai ya karna and all that. So, we are definitely, the Dharavi has become almost like a verb and a metaphor for a lot of representation of market driven housing uh, components. Uh, but you know, uh, in the third five-year plan, um, the conversation around housing, uh, the conversation around urban emerged from the housing question. So nobody was talking about urban planning or anything. Everybody was talking a lot about housing, the necessity to have housing for people who had, uh, uh, you know, there were a lot of refugee population in Delhi. Uh, there was a lot of. Uh, because before that the colonial improvement trust uh, or the local self-government had done a fair amount of land acquisition in many cities like Kanpur, Lucknow, Patna. Um, these are, I know, of course, you know, in Bombay and Madras and all it, the improvement, the colonial improvement trust had done much before. So they had developed this model of acquiring land for housing and then of elite encroachment of those land uh, which was meant for improving. So they would always use two categories for it. One was improving the derelict, uh, congested neighborhoods of the inner city and the other was providing housing for uh, sweepers who were working in the municipalities. These were very two clear categories, okay? And which eventually evolved into EWS housing or economically weaker section housing. And in post-independent India, then the housing board had categories like the lower income group, middle income group and higher income group. So, you know, something which you also flag that, you know, the need to categorize is also important. Um, eventually, what happened was that the land which was categorized for lower income group was perpetually encroached by the middle income groups and then, you know, vice versa. The middle income group was perpetually encroached by higher income groups. Now, uh, uh, so the logic in the five-year plan for urban planning was largely drawn from housing um, and the improvement trust in 60s uh, got a lot of funding through LIC and government bodies for housing. They again, it, there was a lot of elite encroachment because like I said, the access to power, information and social network determines how you occupy housing. So it is not a very innocent question of housing for all and everybody has equal access to power, information and of course monetary this thing. So in my own work and I'm recently, one of my paper gets published, I'm saying that how access to bureaucratic information that what project is coming, where, how, how much, you know, how much loan is coming from Hatko and other thing, then gave a very, uh, very uh, systematic Develop the systematic process of encroachment uh, by the bureaucracy, you know, the, all the elite groups like the doctors, the professors, the judges and everyone and how it also was very conducive with the state politics itself. So we also need to remember that the 60s and 70s was also this shift from, um, you know, the hunky-dory imagination of a newly developed independent country, you know, 67 was the first time the non-Congress government had come in India across the country, okay? 
and then the plot of socialist governments had also come in power after 67 and 70s we saw a formation of a lot of different kind of uh, parties which drew itself from identity politics so you know obc categorization or upper caste maybe backward upper caste categorization and then the politics became very uh, uh, precarious in the sense you know the shift was very momentary and a lot of these negotiations were then ha happening around acquiring land and housing. You know, you can even see in Rajasthan there's a lot of work, work by Sanjeev Vidyarthi and others. They have shown that how in the 70s a lot of this political maneuvering was happening because uh, was being transacted through land and housing. Okay, and then by 70s and 70, 73, 74, 74 is the time when housing board came across the country in different states, you know, so uh, we also uh, had this practice of like, you know, North Indian states drawing its inspiration from DDA, so what was happening in DDA, and of course Western India was drawing its inspiration from what was happening in Bombay. Uh, when the housing board came, it was also almost the same time when HUTCO came into, in, uh, into its form, and they started giving a lot of uh, funds for housing construction you know even housing board had the same uh, categorization and that time world bank was also interested in again funding a lot of slum improvement programs or what we that time called environmental improvement programs for uh, for a lot of these uh, cities in india unfortunately most of them uh, didn't do really well because by 70s the center had also withdrawn itself from seeking accountability about housing from states so before that, the centre would continuously seek accountability that how much of funding has been transferred, how much are they actually building, what has been the target, etc. But uh, eventually, it also it started withdrawing itself. Also, just to remember, remember that uh, in 60s, a lot of rational and logic for housing was coming for industrial housing because there was a lot of cities like Bhubaneswar, Rao Kela. Uh, you know, in Bihar, I can remember Barauni, there was refinery, there was Gohadi refinery, and a lot of these housing rations were, was also for industrial improvement housing. So, like I always say, I am the best example of a welfare state driven because I grew up in a township, in a colony, from, so I progressed from E type, D type, C type. You know, as you progress, as your father progressed, you lived in all these two room, three room, four room bungalows, etc. Uh, but now, uh, by 70s, a lot of encroachment had then started happening for these kind of housing also. You can find similar metaphors for Bombay, uh, you know, read Sandeep Hazir work on Bombay Improvement Trust here. It, it is a fantastic example of how we did encroachment. So then a kind of neighborhoods you see now are not by default, but they have been systematically built for privilege. Okay? So housing can never be a very innocent question because now most cities apart from you know because it's only Bombay and maybe Delhi to some extent which also even makes their master plans and development plans other cities don't do it like most second third cities never did after 60s and of course now after JNR there was a compulsion so they all copy pasted each other CDP etc but uh, 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 you know most cities didn't have housing component in that form but most cities practiced the component of urban planning through housing. So there was always land acquisition and then there was elite encroachment and then was like, oh, it is becoming very congested, we need nali chahiye, drain chahiye, pachara chahiye. And then they would somehow try and manage around it and then make it like an urban planning exercise. Okay? So it, it, it started trapping itself in a viscous cycle from which I don't think we have ever come out of it. Most second tier, third cities are really struggling. And then now, in you know what we call the neoliberal mode of conversations about urban as an issue, uh, most of these cities are now in a perpetual cycle of encroachment drive. So I know in Patna that they have encroachment drive, mega encroachment drive, maha encroachment drive, special encroachment drive, because they are just trying to clear up spaces which has been encroached for all the section of people who were never provided housing on whose rational and logic land was acquired in the very beginning okay so i don't have unfortunately the map but in 
in in Patna, like there is a clear pattern that all the sites where Improvement Trust and Housing Board had acquired land for uh, lower income housing groups are the same sites now which has immense population living in slum like conditions. Okay, so the the category of slum also in second tier three, third city is not in the same way as we deal here. Okay, so these those are like derelict housing or congested areas which could have been very neatly taken care of, but that was not our priority. Uh, also, you know the whole conversation about caste, minority group in this conversation about housing is extremely important because like I said, not everybody can access housing in the same way. So it's not an innocent question that, oh, we want housing or we are building a housing for all and it is equally available to everyone in the same way. It also depends on all in your social networks, in your information, you know, what mental like the paper materiality of who gets what, okay, that is also a very important question in this conversation. So, that is what I want everyone to remember and remind themselves that when you talk about housing question at this point of time, take a step back, look what all has happened, what all we have failed and probably we should not try and repeat the same mistakes. Thank you very much. Have a great Sunday. Thank you, Shima, for that. Uh, a lot of hard talk there. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, Rohit can I invite you on stage now? Yeah. Yeah. Rohit is going to talk about uh, using uh, literacy to shape knowledge production and redefine expertise for an informed policy making process for the urban margins. Uh, learnings from Center for Inclusive Habitat. Hello. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, uh, so much for inviting me and I feel very glad to be the third in the line because the context couldn't have been set better by Gautam Sir and Shiva ma'am. So uh, before actually jumping on to what I'm about to share with every one of you, my entry point in the housing has been predominantly from two lenses. One has been from the lens of thinking about housing beyond a house, beyond four walls and a roof. Which is what uh, both my earlier speakers have also pushed on that the moment we think about housing as building a new house, there is problem because then we de-recognize or we don't recognize a lot of existing housing which is built by people themselves. And my second entry point has been through the issue of land because urban land is such a lesser explored topic when it comes to housing because we, we don't associate housing with the land and especially in metro cities like Mumbai or Bangalore or Delhi the main cost of the housing is the land cost and that the moment we disassociate we only think about redevelopment or green uh, green field kind of a development rather than thinking about alternative ways of thinking about housing like community led like upgradation like retrofitting so what I'm about to present to you today is an initiative which predominantly talks about the thing which actually both of my earlier speakers also said about information asymmetry or what Shima ma'am talked about the access to information right and the moment we have lesser access to information it's much more easier to exploit it's much more easier to enter into the domain which is not understood by these people right so what we have tried to do so me and uh, my uh, friend we tried to build an initiative which is called Center for Inclusive Habitat. Uh, I'll take you through the journey, how we thought about it and then kind of introduce you to the final uh, thing. So our entry point was people-led housing, right? So how do you really think what is people-led housing? Right, so there are different names across different contexts, right? You call it community-led, collective, 
self redevelopment co housing so the terminology is very in different context but essentially what community led housing is where people have the right to participate in any form of a discussion which often becomes very exclusive in nature right and we think about housing beyond professionals beyond expertise because how do we even define expertise right often expertise itself is such a elusive term right this person is a housing expert this person is this expert because when you think about expert you are disassociating also with the lived reality of the people which do not have a say and that is something which we thought can only be thought through a participatory approach through a community led approach where people are not just uh beneficiaries but they are also partners in the process so it divides across like we identified the problem brainstormed around solutions and that's what i'm going to show you so there are different kinds of problems which we broadly bucketed into this five sort of uh, concerns or challenges one is of course the conducive policy and regulatory environment uh, which both of us also spoke about where often the policies are designed for a certain way to look at housing which is more redevelopment oriented then of course the lack of strong institutions or collectives where people public private and lot of civil society organizations also coming together to have a discussion then community cohesion and ownership right like how do you define community right often so based on lot of my interactions with different settlements informal settlements uh, in different cities in india the idea of community itself is not a very homogeneous sort of a, a idea because often community itself when you start deconstructing it there are different power structures within a community right someone can be who has a more weight in saying what should happen in a particular settlement which has some sort of a direct line with the local councillor or a real estate developer which becomes an all the more difficult to how do you define a majority uh, sort of an aspiration in a settlement then strong political will of course i'm not even going into that we all know we are in maharashtra and we have seen different political wills every day and but the problem we thought to tackle was the accurate and reliable information how can we enter into this problem so that what we try to create becomes an easy medium for civil society and the last my users to understand so uh, we all know the slum uh, redevelopment concept it's a cross subsidizing model right where there is a rehab component there is a sale component this image is fixed in our heads and often this image is also translated into the reality right for a station there are so many different parts like you can just see this reality across so i'm not going into the slum rehabilitation for this audience everyone knows this what we try to kind of build on is sort of this approach where there is some sort of an information which is our context is basically the slum rehabilitation scheme particularly based in maharashtra after the unified development control regulations came into picture now there is lot of information there in any if you have read any clause any policy any scheme there are different clauses to it and often these clauses are so complicated that even professionals or so called experts like us it becomes very difficult to read it multiple times and now even if we put it in chat gpt even chat gpt might give up i think because they are so complicated sometimes right so we thought like how do we use this information synthesize it create like a very easy to understand interface so that that would lead for people to engage more for instance i'll give you a simple example like uh, when i talk to my mother for example and if i tell that my mother still uh, questions me that what exactly i work on and it's very difficult to explain urban planning to my mom right but then i have to break it by not using urban and not using planning and still explaining her, her urban planning it becomes very easy for her to understand what i'm doing and that's exactly a very simple concept you take at a community level at a city level at a national level if you can break down the information into simple nuggets then people engage it engage with it more and when people engage with it they have more agency in really sitting on a level playing field with a developer with a bureaucrat or with a any government officer and that's exactly what we are trying to do so our model essentially is we are trying to create a housing literacy platform which of course cuts across this different domain legal literacy technical literacy procedural literacy financial literacy and some case studies and what we are essentially trying to do is how can our technical knowledge which we break up into simple information becomes a medium to reach to the last mile user becomes a medium to reach to the community 
through lot of players in between who are basically working towards housing. So there were certain goals, initial short term goals which we thought uh, when we started the initiative that understanding the whole uh, love housing landscape. So I am from Thane, my friend is from Thane. So we took Thane as one of the main pilots and uh, we started kind of uh, defining uh, what, are, what is the area of Thane, where are the informal settlements located, what are the different wards. And we started visiting a lot of these uh, different informal settlements, did a lot of multi-stakeholder sort of conversations. With one of the biggest challenges we also faced was finding good NGOs or community-based organizations who actually work only predominantly in informal housing. So we had to find our entry points with, let's say, some NGOs working in uh, education space but in the informal settlement. So trying to understand how they look at the informal settlements, talking to different practicing architects who are actually doing slum rehabilitation projects, talking to a lot of lenders, investors, because a lot of this uh, slum redevelopment builds on the idea of this developer directly taking the loan from uh, the investor, right? But the moment we think about concept like self-redevelopment or community-led development, the biggest issue is the project finance, right? So for example, some of you might have heard about self-redevelopment, let's say what Chandrasekhar Prabhu talks about in, in, in middle-income housing, where a cooperative housing society acts as a developer, takes the loan from the bank and then basically has the agency to decide what will be the rehab safe component so that the quality of housing is also not uh, lesser for the rehab, it's an equal sort of a quality. But the moment you shift self-redevelopment for low-income housing or for the urban poor, the biggest challenge is where do you get the project finance, right? Because they don't have any sort of a security or title security for them to get the loan from the bank. And that's where the, the problem becomes much more complicated. So we try to break this, like I said, like also legal literacy. So what we try to do is, we, co we basically also summarized and collated a lot of different government circulars, resolutions and notifications which are there from 1995 till date, right? And one of the biggest challenges we found is there are, there are, so, uh, there, there are so many and uh, located in such uh, complex government website that it's very difficult to even like download it or to find it. It's not very easy to kind of access. And that's something, uh, the access is something which is a major problem which we thought let us then try to spend some time and try to create some sort of a repository which can be easy to understand and easy to download and read. And uh, we also tried to convert all the clause by clause we took each and every regulation and converted into graphics in English and in Marathi. So for example, who is eligible, right? So there is an actual occupant, there is a structure owner. So there is that sort of a binary way of looking at eligible. Then there are cutoff dates and then there is premium, there is FSI, there is TDR. There are so many complex regulations which often needs to be broken down so that people understand what they are getting into and what they might be getting into if they give their consent for the redevelopment. Then technical literacy, right? So often we realize that, uh, like for example, how do you calculate FSI? Right? How do you think about a plot area? What is the built up area? And how? what is that brick? How much sale component you need to create that rehab component? What is the profit margin? All of this, the moment for example if I create a facade that this is all let's say a, a not so good scheme versus a, a, a good scheme, you are not really entering into the complexity of explaining this concept. And the moment you don't have that entry point, it becomes very easy to kind of then uh, uh, the decision to be one sided. So we kind of broke that as well. And then procedural literacy. Now one of the biggest sort of a shock or a surprise we had was for 20 years, like 95, right? So we are talking about 30 years. There is not a single document which talks about A to Z of how a slum redevelopment project really happens. We spoke to so many practicing architects because for example, like slum redevelopment also is like an expertise within uh, architecture. Not all architects who even want to enter into slum redevelopment. Because it has a lot of these grey areas where you have to go from sub-engineer to assistant engineer to executive engineer to CEO of SRA and there is so much murkiness around this concept that it is very difficult to explain anyone that what is point A to point B to point C to really think about redevelopment. But within our, within, uh, our limited sort of an understanding and whatever we could, we tried to divide broadly into three phases with different kind of graphics. So this is one of the graphics. Uh, it's a little like, uh, small, but then what we try to do is we try to visualize. For example, phase one is the general meetings, and there are three main stakeholders. There's a cooperative housing society, there is a developer slash architect, 
and then there is from the application authority. At each phase, what role that one of the three stakeholders has in that? How would the participation look like? For example, we talk about participatory governance, but how many of us can even try to go one step beyond and say to people who are living in the settlements what is participatory, right? What are they supposed to ask? What are they supposed to know, right? That also is a much more ethnographic or much more you need to understand human behavior also. Are they afraid of asking, right? So there are a lot, lot, lot of other layers also within that. So we try to kind of visualize that and kind of uh, use uh, in different phases what is one's role. For example, in this particular image, this is phase one. If you look at cooperative housing society, it says forming provisional sketches. So forming provisional cooperative housing society is one of the first steps for a sketches. Then what is the role of SRA? SRA's role is keeping a check to ensure that the meeting is proceeding as per the government guidelines, right? So there will be different phases where not every time you have some NRI or where do you find this project finance to be able to lessen the appetite of profit, right? If I can put it like that. So of course, like, what are the opportunities? What is the way forward? So yes, definitely dissemination to the right audience, communities and civil society have this different expert, so if, I, if we have to call it expert, but at least then try to deconstruct this portion, talk to a financial uh, investor, talk to a, a, a licensing architect, talk to a contractor, talk to NGOs, there has to be different sort of feedback, there has to be a user feedback as to how do people define it. So I'll give you a small example, so in one of the case field visits I was working on an interesting uh, project on informal settlements and I realized the aspiration of an informal settlement dweller in Jaipur is very different from the aspiration of informal settlement dweller in Mumbai and that's why I think Shibama was also trying to win. Sometimes we are so obsessed with Mumbai problem that becomes Maharashtra problem and then becomes India problem which is apparently not, right? So the aspiration of a settlement dweller in Jaipur is not about getting the house in a building but it is about getting the tenural rights on land, getting a patta because there is space. Whereas in Mumbai, the aspiration is to get a flat in a building, even if the building would be in shabby condition because that is looked as an upgradation towards their social mobility, right? So it's important to also understand the aspiration and it's also important to you also not to go with that entry point ki hum sabko ek redevelopment karenge, sabko achcha ghar denge. We have to kind of understand what are their aspirations as well. So it's much more complex. So I'll just, uh, so this is the website everyone can access. I'll just see if the internet is working here. Uh, yeah, it is. So uh, it's in English and Marathi. It's called CHAP, Center for Inclusive Habitat. And maybe I'll just go with Marathi version. So for example, there are different like uh, legal literacy, procedural literacy, technical literacy, and financial literacy. So for example, if I click on any one of this, let's say first phase one, how does it look like, right? What are the different phases? So, if, so it's like, of course it's much more uh, deeper, but then I'm happy to kind of uh, connect later if anyone wants to understand this further. So there are different steps and you can also read what is written in each slide, what are the steps, what is the next step. Then uh, within that, there is also a clause by, so if you see here, there is 14.7.1, 14.7.2. So these are actual clauses in the Unified Development Control Regulations, uh, where the clause of 14.7 chapter of slum rehabilitation scheme. So if you click at any clause, what we have done is essentially broken into, uh, broken that into a sort of a graphical literacy, so that this, for example, if you have to uh, explain someone what is, what is the difference between uh, ownership versus rental, right? How do you break that? How do you show something visual? Because when you show visual, it sticks with people and they have more sort of a authority and uh, skin in the game, right? So this is what you are trying to do. So of course I won't go too much deeper into this, but happy to talk more about it later. So, thank you.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So while uh, you get the mic, Minas, uh, Mira has a question.
in a mahada home they are owners so there are different categories of people who are there in the existing buildings but then over the years it has so happened that all of them feel that apne malki ka to hona chahiye so essentially populism is taking over there and the policy framers feel that people aspire for that ownership home and people want that ownership home free of charge so let us give it that way the point that i made there was that if you want to make a beginning as to how do you introduce rental concept in that i think the best thing would be if you are talking about a slum scheme that in a slum scheme every resident in the slum does not become an eligible person to get a home you always have a cut off date you have people staying on the mezzanine floor who are thrown out so a rehabilitation process ends up in becoming both rehabilitation and displacement so those people who are not getting eligible for a free home i think the beginning could be that for them you have a rental concept so an srs scheme need not be only ownership homes you should have ownership homes for those who you have already promised that i'll give you a free ownership home but then also there are many people there who are either staying as tenant or who are actually come up after the cut off date bring in the rental housing concept for them i think that would be a very good entry point for rental housing to be brought in uh you know like i completely agree with sir and one small addition i have is like there's also a lot of examples within india and as this link they just talking also that across other countries right like south american countries or uh, in southeast asia where the approach is also like from a collective way so for example the closer home and the there was a slum networking project slum networking program where the idea was not to give uh, slums titles or redevelopment sort of an approach but it was about giving a 10 year no eviction guarantee the moment you give no eviction guarantee lot of people then and giving them basic services people start investing in their houses so that's also an alternative way to think beyond just redevelopment uh, or beyond just like ownership for example because ownership unfortunately is very easy right you can just put it like in a black and white and when it is easy people think that it's 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 conveniently uh, deployed on ground so but that's not how it is right? so. one more information which i just read in the newspaper from this back this point which i just made of people who are not eligible will be provided rental has actually been accepted i think by the maharashtra government for dharavi development and i i read that in dharavi development they have said that no one will be disowned people who are not eligible for a, a, a ownership housing will be provided a rental housing though it is actually a, a relocated site maybe they are looking at mulund and some other places but still at least everyone will get a house so we are moving towards housing for all right so you know um, one thing is of course in india the emphasis on always having a house like you know when i was doing my own thesis patna um, uh, they would say ki aapki shaadi nahi hogi agar aapke paas patna shehar mein ghar nahi hai and that whole emphasis of house even in bombay everybody keeps asking aapke paas ghar hai ki nahi that's a very typical indian mentality where your parents aspire ki ghar hona chahiye and all that kind of thing Uh, but rental housing you know when hatko had come into formation they would actually finance a lot of rental housing in the housing boards uh, but then how those rental housing were eventually encroached and then uh, the litigation was uh, so prolonged that eventually the housing board then started saying that okay you buy it and you know and people would not uh, even pay uh, this thing so that's what i can think of like and bombay i don't really comment much now. things become important we are see one is the scale you know, otherwise if the scale is very low then you will have this problem of gentrification and also the encroachment of a person occupying and not living looking upon a rental house also as that i am the owner of that so you will have to scale it up number one and two which i mentioned in my talk is the proper o and m you will not leave it to a mada to manage the rental homes you will have to think of professional bodies which will create maybe a section 8 company a non profit company under the companies act or something like that which will professionally manage those rent homes i think these two aspects will be important in this one more question i have how housing is looked at because it is maximization of profit and land value and another thing is housing is also looked at service also so housing is a commodity or housing is a service it is 
that when you are talking about housing and if you are leaving the concept of housing to market forces, then obviously you have to forget about how do you cater to the housing for the marginalized community. So the state has a very great role to play here in the aspect of planning, in the aspect of implementation, and everywhere the state will have to come in. The concept of trying to bring in a private sector and thinking that the private sector will take care of that, then it will be looked upon as a commodity. But it is not so. Actually, it is not a finished product, it's a process, as in fact we also mentioned, that it's not something that you will finish a house and say that yes, this is an artificial design, beautiful home, uh, conforming to the development control regulation. Every individual staying here is in his own way doing a self-built housing. The need is for the state to recognize the efforts from those people and to see how do you improve upon that so that you can bring them into the formal network. I think that's how the state has to play a much major role in trying to look upon housing as something which everyone will have access to. So, under simple logic, uh, Marx and Angel also started actually writing first about housing only, right? Why? Because a city is where economy is happening, right? And there is you had mills, you had factory, and they had the social, res they had the responsibility for their employees. You know, you go out a little of Bombay and you see Bhimandi. It's, it's a huge place where a lot of different kind of informal economy is happening. But there is not one housing, even private company-based housing program, right? So eventually, everybody has withdrawn. They want the city's economy to be there. But you know now the city, city economy is broken so much into different informal setup that housing has completely gone into the private market this day. So everybody has to fundamentally understand the connection that why are you in the city, whom are you operating for or working for and whose responsibilities. So this whole burden, uh, this whole transferring of burden from the state to the individual has happened unfortunately in everything. आप परफॉर्म नहीं कर रहे हैं ना इसीलिए आप कोई शूज है आप यू शुड लर्न हाउ टू इन्वेस्ट इन म्यूचुअल फंड्स इट्स दैट टाइप ऑफ अलग चीज वन स्टेटमेंट लाइक आई थिंक आई ट्रूली बिलीव लाइक हाउसिंग इज लाइक एन इकोसिस्टम इट्स नॉट अ हाउस it's like it's like it's not just one body part. It's like when one body part functions, the other things also get affected. So I feel it's an ecosystem. Just because someone is not designing four walls and a room, but also like let's say Paniyak Samiti is giving access to water rights to a lot of people who are non people who are non-notified settlements. They are also doing housing work. They are not doing water service work. That's also part of the housing. So I think housing as a concept need to be looked beyond just the unit. Uh, so, uh, just a, maybe a larger uh, observation or a question we can... Uh, so, uh, do, do we need to completely shift our lens of looking at informants? Uh, the, the way we look at so many typologies to it throughout the past and do we need to completely shift our lens of looking at it? That is one. And uh, there have been, uh, so uh, like uh, Rohit also mentioned the uh, slum networking project and so many different mod models and typologies that have been experimented before. Mm, sites and services types, or slum networking was one more in C2. Uh, you know, so are, are we, like, like, why is it that those are not at all being, um, I don't know, be brought into the conversations? That is one. And when we say that we want the state to play a more proactive role, um, do we need to diffuse that uh, a little bit more so that there can be mechanisms that, that can be set up to? in order to take this ahead. Uh, I mean, uh, I don't know if these are just comments or if anybody wants to. Uh, <laughs> I think there's a question from the students also, right? Uh, One second. I think just a couple of things. So on the lens of looking at informers, I think, yeah, I, uh, I really feel uh, I think Gautam Bhan tells it very beautifully. He says that the the stakeholders or the interest groups who build the maximum housing in a country like India and a lot of other countries are not the architects, not the developers, not the state, not the civil society. It is the people themselves. And the moment we talk about eviction, redevelopment, building from scratch, 
we are essentially not recognizing the existing efforts which people have put over a period of time. And I think if it does not fit in that category, that is not formal, so that becomes informal, and informal conveniently becomes illegal, and illegal conveniently becomes ripe for redevelopment, and then we are stuck in that vicious loop. Whereas the lens of maybe recognizing something which is existing, but also not romanticizing it, is equally important. For example, there will be so many settlements where the houses are in good condition, but they are still, there is a massive water mafia. They don't have legal access to water. So can the fight be towards giving them access to water? There has to be an incremental approach towards looking at informality rather than freehold versus ownership versus uh, non-ownership sort of thing. So, yeah, that's So good morning sir. So my question is, housing is a very contested issue even today, which is based not only uh, based on class based segregation, but also the segregation based on ethnicity and caste. So how are we as architecture students who are about to take mass housing, mass housing project in our upcoming semester to tackle with these TLI problems and also comply with the regulatory framework that the DCI provides? Quite a burning question, I think. Uh, you know, this uh, housing being uh, restrictive to certain ethnicities or certain other things is a problem that we have, and in fact, this was tackled through rules in the Maharera. If you go into the Maharera rules, it has said that it is a penal offense if some developer, while developing a project of housing, is refusing to give access to someone on the basis of whatever, gender, caste, religion, whatever. That becomes a punishable offence. So this was actually intended and people wanted that this should be brought in the Parent Act. Though it has not been put in the Parent Act, but in the rules, which is subordinate legislation, this has been brought in. I only hope that people know about this because the problem today in our country is, as he was trying to remove this information asymmetry among people by bringing out all those things. How do we reach out to people? How do we create the awareness that something exists which you should make use of and if it is penal, 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 penal offence, then try and penalise the person who is trying to violate that. So I think uh, steps have been taken in that direction. What maybe is needed for young architects like you First, to know that there is something that is there and then try to see how can you reach it out to the people. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir. Any more questions or... Uh, yeah, somebody please. Thank you, So, uh, my first piece on that is role of the architect should be more humble. 
that they are not the ultimate gods who will design and give people what they want because that is that usually happens right when it's like it's very easy for uh, like we see a lot of these projects where architects or urban designers play a very high ground that we are designing this so it has to be acceptable to you kind of a lens without actually directly saying that so that is one thing which i feel is very important where it is important to also be a facilitator it's not always about the architect designing it can be what people want to be designed and then architect using their technical knowledge or technical ex expertise if i can call it and using that expertise only for something which is very much need based in that community rather than trying to create something and trying to push it over shove it down to the community that you need that uh, i'll give you one very small example so the masters program which i did was a practice based masters program and the whole concept was that every year for 3 years non stop uh, the students from our course go to that community and work with those organizations who are working there in that settlement and try to build on what they are doing rather than coming up with our something emphasis and trying to push it over there and i think that's a very good approach to also build that relation which can also be then scaled up and replicated across different parts of the city and maybe even in the country because then you have a healthy relation with the people you have respected their thoughts and their needs also as well when we talk about housing on virgin land or where we don't have pre identified people who will be actual users of that housing it may be difficult for the architect while designing that as to how do you bring in the people's perspective into that because then you are actually uh, working for the parent developer who has actually contracted you for this work but i feel that very strongly an architect who is working on a brownfield project a redevelopment project whether it is slums or redevelopment of a housing society or accessibility you have existing dwellers who have their own concept of what are their house should be the redeveloped house should be i feel pain when i find that in such projects there is no interaction that the architect has has with the people i would feel that the architect should prevail upon the parent developer that in such projects we need to talk to them i'll give you an example some 30 40 years back when for the first time we were trying to do in the pmgp project which has a 100 crore dharavi first redevelopment that was taken up in dharavi people felt that humse to puche humko malum hai hamara ghar hai especially the ladies in the home they felt ki ghar kaisa hona chahiye design kaisa hona chahiye kitchen kaisa hona chahiye we would like to as the contribute and we actually tested it out by getting an architect of their choice who we said that this is the people's architect he will sit with the people he will design their homes and that we will accept so that was the partnership which we tried to build with the people i feel that this is possible we could not replicate that i really wish that that gets replicated especially when we talk about redevelopment and there you have a role to play yeah uh, there's one more question maybe good morning everyone i have a question for rohit sir so the question would be like, what are various indicators to be included while making an education based toolkit for a common man to understand housing and largely redevelopment based housing in mumbai in mumbai <laughs> last year mumbai aaya so anyways i think uh, my question is independent of mumbai also i think housing as a subject is very different from a sometimes from an academician's lens from an urban designer's lens from an architect's lens so yeah that's a great question so i think like one of the there are two ways in which one can look at it one is what is existing right there is an existing regulatory framework policy framework which has certain basic terminology around housing which will always be there like the most simplest one which comes to my mind is fsi right now fsi or far right sometimes that also people call it far now floor space index in what are the best ways you can kind of break this terminology when people let's say read in a newspaper right because that's the most easy to access medium right for lot of people or like what is premium right what is additional fsi so there are certain technical terms which needs to be broken down which is one of the things which we have tried to do 
So that is one of the aspects which needs to be broken down. And other is, of course, this idea of redevelopment, upgradation, retrofitting, community-led development, developer-led uh, up like upgradation or developer-led approach. So there are different variations in which one thinks about this redevelopment or upgradation or retrofitting or regeneration or renewal. So there are a lot of this interchangeably and loosely used terms which often uh, are not really broken down and spoken about. So I think that is another way to look at it in a non-technical set of indicators. So there are two, two things which comes to my mind right now at least.
condition that is climate change. Good afternoon everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our panel discussion on climate change and architecture, where we will explore the critical intersection between architectural practices and environmental sustainability. Today we are honored to have a distinguished panel of experts who bring a wealth of knowledge and experience to this crucial conversation. Allow me to introduce our esteemed moderator, Studi Borwankar. She is an environmental architect and holds a master's degree in environmental architecture. She has also completed a course in advanced computer arts. Her interests lie in designing, from graphics to interiors to architecture and city planning. She is deeply concerned with issues related to environmental planning and development and is one of the founding members of Grassroots. She also has worked on independent interior design projects and on green architectural projects. The floor is yours, ma'am. Environment in the context of climate change adaptation. 
So, uh, very good afternoon to all the students and colleagues from Rajvi and the guests. So, uh, today I am just going to talk to you about a uh, few projects I have been working on. And uh, just for, because I understand many of the students are here, I will show a uh, few slides where I actually come from. And when I was a student like you, uh, I started my journey in the field of disasters especially with the Gujarat earthquake housing and after that uh, many of my friends said you know why are you working in the disasters I come from uh, you know Hyderabad and all the places so in fact I never knew that has become in my course of life so after that I worked in uh, tsunami affected areas in Tamil Nadu and then I, and then I was working in UK and uh, then again the Kashmir earthquake came so I was actually shipping houses, prefab houses from UK to Pakistan, POK. And I never knew that there was a, which site I am doing. I never knew that uh, who is the owner, what kind of site context. So I was basically doing a kind of flat pack approaches. So that is where I realized I'm willing in myself. So what I should not do. And that's where I thought of, okay, why not I do a little more research. And I ended up doing my PhD in the tsunami affected areas. So that's how uh, the journey has started. So now I'm going to not talk about any of my PhD or anything like that, but I'm just going to talk to you about the for the past last five years. Uh, I would say about eight years now I've been working in the mountain settlements in the Himalayas. So before we come to the Himalayas, what I would like to really bring forward is the climate change because so this session, there are two key words in this session. One is the climate change and your conference theme, which is the people. So I'm going to address both the things, uh, how people are more important in the climate change aspect, and especially how architecture comes to mediate with this whole process. So uh, I'd like to refer uh, Gutkin's understanding of four stages of man's changing attitude in the environment. So it starts with I throw to I eat. Let me see how it is. The first stage is always started with characterized with fear. Because if you ever read a book called Sapiens, uh, Yuval Mahal Harari, he talks about the agricultural revolution. And uh, he talks about how um, with the invent of uh, agricultural revolution, how hills have transformed into plains, how maps have started settling down in the plain environments for getting